Of course, I had to cut my nap short also. <laughs> okay, this talk. So hopefully this will be worth your time. Um, again, excuse me, I'm a little bit hoarse, but I feel fine, so I, I apologize for the tone of my voice. And hopefully this will be worth your time, because this is material that is very, very hard to get at. Uh, most of what I'll be talking about, you may not have heard of at all. A lot of the excavations in Arabia started as late as the 1950s. As the 1950s. And it takes a long time for the raw archaeological data to be processed and actually come down in secondary literature. So, you know, maybe a few of these terms I'll use, you might think, oh my god, National Geographic, 30 years ago, I remember something about this. It is a very exciting area to do archaeology and study in Arabia. And when I say Arabia, I mean the Arabian Peninsula. In pre Islamic times, there was a tremendous amount of activity going on in this area, in the area which is now Yemen, Oman, uh, Bahrain, and the UAE, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, which is, of course, um, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Dubai, where we're putting in. The geography of this area is extremely interesting because when we think about Arabia, most people think about the Rub al Khali, the great empty quarter, which has big zero, nothing in it. <laughs> and you know, the Saudis really, um, you know, good going, guys, you got that part of the country. But what is extremely interesting is, oops, the area around, especially in this area, there are very, very tall mountains through here. This is Yemen. Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, is at 8,000 feet. I'll give you an idea. Very, very mountainous. And then the mountains continue here. Uh, Salala, we'll look at tomorrow. It's like the almighty being just stuck his tongue on the coast. So there's a big depression and huge mountains thrown up around it in a semicircle, and then a big series of mountains up this way. So what this means is these areas down here along the shore are often very, very fertile because as the clouds come in and the winds come in, the clouds have to rise up over these very tall mountains. So they dump all of their moisture along the coast to get up over the top of these mountains. So it's a very different sort of um, environment of what you might expect from Arabia. And it is some of the most striking, beautiful part of the world I've ever been in. It is just, and it is so foreign. It's really, really foreign. So the big centers of ancient uh, activity are in the area of what is now um, North and South Yemen, and also this area of Southern, Southwestern Saudi Arabia. That area was always contested. It's still kind of a dotted line in some atlases. Um, an area through here, and then where we're going to be tomorrow, this is Dofar province in Oman. This area through here is the big frankincense center. That is where most of the frankincense in the ancient world was coming from, right in this area. And I'll show you a picture of one of the frankincense stalls in Salala. It's amazing. You're going to see so much frankincense tomorrow, you're not going to be able to hold it. And then another big ridge of mountains up here, so a lot of habitation through here, and also what they haven't managed to pave over in Dubai and Abu Dhabi had some very important early settlements. And then also, as I mentioned, Bahrain is an important uh, part of this whole thing. So I'm going to talk briefly about Bahrain because it helps to make sense of why this entire area, the edges of Arabia, were so very, very important in the ancient world. The, they, of course, were famous for their trade. This is a, um, a overland and sea trade. And so again, the areas of the, of the frankincense are through here. And if you notice, of course, the sea trade going through will we'll be right up in here at the end of our trip. And you notice one of the big centers up here is Petra. So the frankincense is coming out of the frankincense coast, as it was called, coming up. And notice this. This is very important for some of the monuments I'll be showing you in Yemen. It comes up through this area, goes through Petra, through, uh, through Fostat, which is uh, the, the old word name for Cairo, out, and then all through this area. And then you get the, the spice trade, the, the silk route through here. So these areas were not as off the chart as you would think they were. They were very, very tied in to the ancient trade routes. So they're sending a lot of, primarily frankincense, out. They were also transshipping a lot of spices from the east. But of course what that means is they're bringing in a lot of the equivalent of income. So there were these very advanced civilizations and really fabulous monumental architecture that's being built down in the area of Nowheresville, according to you know people in this area in Europe. It's like they have no conception of where all this stuff is. But it's extremely interesting. Another thing that's very, very important is this area of Oman, 
this used to, and here's Musanda, which is part of Oman, which today is actually separated from the main part of Oman uh, by part of the UAE. So it's, it's very complicated. There are, again, a lot of disputed areas in here. This was a major center for copper. It was one of the biggest copper mining areas in the ancient world. And so we see it's a huge amount of trade from this area in copper that goes up. This is Mesopotamia, so Sumer, Babylon, Assyria. Of course, all of these guys need the copper because copper you make bronze out of. If you remember, it goes to the Chalcolithic period, which is the Copper Age, and then you have the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And so everybody wants what's coming out of here. Also, Oman is very rich in this beautiful stone called chlorite, which is a black, beautifully, it takes a beautiful finish, and there are um, chlorite vessels that show up all over this area, even into, into Persia, and most of that stone is coming out of Oman. So Oman and these areas had a lot of natural resources that people wanted in the ancient world. So looking first at, at Yemen, to give you some context, Yemen is the best documented of these ancient Arabian cultures. And the classical historians, Herodotus, Strabo, Pliny, they all mention Yemen, talk about it. Yemen shows up in the Old Testament. For example, frankincense from Yemen is, bring, is brought to um, King Solomon. The major character in Yemen is Bilqis. Bilqis is, the, uh, is who we know in the Western tradition as the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba, we think, was an actual person in Yemen. She ruled Yemen about 950 BC. And she shows up in all sorts of wonderful contexts. Uh, you'll see pictures of the Queen of Sheba in the stained glass and chart. You'll see the Queen of Sheba on the facades of medieval uh, uh, churches all over the West. And this is because of this sort of uh, incredible idea of Bilkis or Sheba and, of course, her association with King Solomon. There are a bunch of different traditions of Bilkis and Solomon. One is that Solomon heard that there was this gorgeous queen, Bilkis, Sheba, whatever. Bilkis and Sheba, person, same person. And, but then he heard, she's actually this demon. She's a beautiful woman, but she has hairy legs and hooves of a donkey. Uh-oh. <laughs> and so he wanted to uh -oh. check this out. She had donkey legs. You know, this is not a good thing, right? You know, she's rich. She's got a great personality. But, and so, so there were some of these wonderful, wonderful traditions of Solomon comes to Yemen, and um, or or Bilkis goes to Solomon. It goes a lot of different ways. And so he has a glass floor put in front of his throne. Another version is well, it's a glass throne. So Bilkis comes in, and she thinks it's water. So she picks up her skirts. No donkey goes. Okay, so it all goes well after that. The Ethiopian tradition is really wonderful, and if those of you who've been to Ethiopia have probably seen these wonderful multi-paneled um, screens telling the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, according to that tradition, um, Sheba visits Solomon, and he, of course, is just smitten with her. You know, who wouldn't be the Queen of Sheba, right? And they go to their respective beds, very proper. But what he, Solomon has done is he's given Sheba uh, water with a whole bunch of salt in it. And so Sheba has to get up in the middle of the night to get more water because she's just dying of thirst. And if she's out getting some water, he sneaks through, into her bed. Surprise! And she comes back. And there, and this is, it gets really interesting because their son, Menelik, is the founder of the dynasty of Haile Selassie. So the Ethiopian royal family traces their roots back to the Queen of Sheba and Solomon. So it's very interesting how all this stuff goes together. So, and by the way, Bilkis, you'll probably see this name in Oman also. Bilkis is a common name for, for females. Bilkis is the same as Sheba. The ancient culture of this area is called the Himurites. The general term is, this is Himuritic writing, which is a Semitic writing. So the Himurites, it's a name of a culture and of a language. And the major manifestations we have of these people are these incredible, incredible monuments, which are, which are spotted up the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula, like this. This is Barrakesh, which is this enormous enclosure. This is a trade entrepot. They built a whole series of these up the coast. Just like in some other cultures, like you go to Turkey, where you have the Hans, they're spotted. 
So every few days of, tr of trade, you could take your camel caravan into the safety of these enormous fortified enclosures and rest and trade. So these things all have to do with this tremendously important incense trade that's going up and down the coasts. In the 20th century, there were a lot more excavations being done that revealed a lot about ancient Yemen. Those of you who are on the east coast of the United States, or if you're around Washington, D.C., a show has just opened, on, I think it's the only show that's ever been done, on an explorer named Wendell Phillips. And Wendell Phillips, come on, he's the original Indiana Jones. He was an American archaeologist who worked in Yemen and also in Oman. There is an exhibit at, it's either the Sackler or the Freer. Somebody here is working at one of those museums. So, um, But it should be absolutely spectacular. He was the head of a group called the American Foundation for the Study of Man. It was all uh, privately founded, the family. He and his sister Marilyn Phillips. And his books were, his book, Kataban and Sheba, I don't know if anybody remember that. It was a big seller in the 60s. And it was about his rough and tumble excavations in, in Yemen. And in the 60s, Yemen was like the 12th century. There was nothing there, basically nothing there. He eventually got booted out of the country. It had something to do with importing a refrigerator. I don't remember the entire thing. But really interesting. Then he goes on, on to Oman. He wrote some very good books about Oman. This guy is a complete character. So if you happen to be in Washington, Go see the Wendell Phillips show. Joe and I are definitely, we have it on our calendar. So we have lots of sources about the ancient Himyaritic kingdom, um, in the, including a 10 volume history of the Himyarites written by Hamdani called the Klal, which means the, the crown. And there are descriptions of these cities of the Himyarites, for example, in Sana'a, which is the current capital of, of Yemen. There are many descriptions of the great Gundan Palace as early as the third century AD and describes either seven or 20 stories of this building with alabaster windows. And those of you who stick with this and come to the last architecture on Arabian architecture, well, you'll see stuff that's basically the Gundam Palace is still standing in Sana'a. So the Himyaritic, uh, Himyaritic uh, kingdom was a series of small rival, often, kingdoms spotted throughout uh, what is now Yemen, as we can see here. So the big centers are uh, Marib, which is here, and then Sana'a, which is here, and then up in here, which is um, Najran, which is the area that's now in Saudi Arabia. And then we'll look at some other areas down here. So um, Sa Saba, which was the great city of the Queen of Sheba, Saba and Sheba are essentially the same, located at Marib, out in the desert, uh, near the empty quarter. It's very clear from about 950 BC, which was a very centralized state, a whole series of kings called Bukhara, which is a term that comes in through, um, it's a Semitic term. And some of these monuments give you an idea of how organized the state was. This is part of the Great Dam at Marib. Now Marib, there are some big wadis that come through through uh, Marib from the Wadi Dahana. And it's a very arid area, but several times a year there are torrential rainfalls and a huge amount of rain comes down the Wadi Dahana. So this is a diversion dam that was built uh, probably about 950 BC. It's a huge, huge uh, piece of engineering. It goes completely across the end of the Wadi to divert this huge amount of water coming down into canals and reservoirs. So this is one of the great engineering marvels of the ancient world. You can see even the masonry, they wave, they've done this to divert the force of the water against it. Here's another scene of this enormous dam at Mar out in the desert. This was destroyed sometime between about 550 BC um, and a little bit later. And this was actually when the great dam at Mar was destroyed. This was a cataclysmic thing which really made it almost impossible to live in that part of of Yemen because you needed that agriculture that was supplied by the dam. There was a lot of trade with the Euphrates. We also have other incredible monuments at Marib from the Queen of Sheba's capital. This is uh, very early in the excavations of the, uh, it's called the Aish Bilkis, or the throne of Bilkis. You can see this, the scale of these uh, columns. And this was before the archaeologists got to them. So these are much, much taller. The kids in Marv, you see the decorated tops, the kids in Marv love, you know, amazing tourists by scooping up between the columns. 
It was uh, a temple, so we not only have some hydraulic monuments, but a temple. This is the great uh, Awam Temple of Bilkis at Maru. And what it is, it's an enormous walled enclosure. The pillars I was just showing you are part of this peristyle. So it's part of the peristyle here. Uh, this is a, an entrance temple, the Propylon. This is a mausoleum on the side. Uh, but one of the largest temples in Arabia, this is now being worked by the German Archaeological Institute, uh, 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 Sana'a. But incredible engineering during this time. So this is, pro this is probably as early as 900 BC. So we're talking very, very early. And you can see even the engineering here, how these uh, the, the peristyle columns have little uh, knobs on the top for the architraves to join them. So this is part of the great enclosure wall and then the entrance temple part of that mausoleum that I mentioned to you. Uh, we don't know, in fact, if it is a ma mausoleum. And in fact, we, the archaeologists have a lot of trouble trying to figure out what this stuff really is. But it's a good indication of how wealthy and prosperous these ancient Arabian cultures were. In the first century AD, we start seeing uh, other sites growing. For example, at Sirwa, one of the main gods of these people, the Hinyarites, are um, El Loke. El Loke is the moon god, and his symbol is the uh, is the oryx. So, which is why you get these really beautiful lines of oryxes inset into the walls. It's a symbol of the moon god El Loke. So, at Sirwa, we have a, oh, excuse me. This is Mayin, another contemporary temple. Again, you can see the use of these monolithic um, stones all quarried nearby. Uh, this is the propylon of a larger temple, and then at Sirwa. The Loki Temple here, the Moon Temple, and typically these ashlar, these huge pieces of stone, huge roofing blocks, so very sophisticated architecture, unfortunately not terribly well preserved. And it's interesting to see how these monuments are often reincorporated into uh, more modern architecture, well, like medieval architecture, because what, what the locals tended to do. So here you can see, again, the monoliths of the propylon of the porch of the temple, and how they've just used it to build a large, much later enclosure and still have some of the original ancient stones standing. And here again, Sirwa, again with the and Mokai uh, ibexes. Even, and here you see the remains of the ancient architecture interspersed with the modern. Even in some parts of Yemen and Oman, when you go to little villages and you see mud brick houses, they'll have ibex skulls on the corners. That's a complete carryover from the uh, from the pre-Islamic. So going back to, going back to the map. Um, so in the first century BC, we have a, a, a rise of a different group of Hinduites that unify basically all of the, the, little, the little civilizations down here. So you have a monolithic group called the Hindurites uh, under the king of Saba. And these people are actually strong enough that they're challenging the Romans. The Romans are sending legations down into Arabia in the first century BC, attack Marib in 25. And the biggest problem between the people who lived in this area and the Romans was the Romans pretty much broke their monopoly on the trade routes, the overland trade routes, and trade moved off into the Red Sea and Indian Ocean, which really led to the collapse of many of the civilizations down here, because the Romans could move the goods quicker through, uh, through sea than they could. Now, a very interesting period comes if, if remember we've got Ethiopia down here, and then Yemen, and these cultures in here. Um, we, oh, and also before I segue from that, these ports that the Romans put in, uh, Bir Ali, and also tomorrow when we're in Salala, Mirbat, which is very near where we're going to be, was one of the great Roman shipping ports for the frankincense trade. So we'll see that, we'll be very near that tomorrow. Now, a very interesting period. In the third century, Christians from Ethiopia came into Yemen. So before that time, it was a polytheistic system. So Christians from Ethiopia come in in the third century BC. And the king of Himyar, the Yemenis, converts to Christianity, and a whole series of churches and cathedrals were built in Yemen with great centers at Thafar, Sana'a, and Najran. So, oops. So, down in 
here, Thafar, Sana'a, and Najran in, in this area were the sites of very, very significant Christian communities. By 350 AD, there was a letter from the Byzantine emperor uh, requesting permission to even expand the churches in Yemen. So at this point, this very far off area was in contact with Byzantium in the north. But there was conflict with another local ruler who, in, it's quite interesting, had converted <coughs> to Judaism. So we have an early Christian Jewish battle going on in Yemen, uh, conducting wars against each other. And the, uh, the, the Jewish ruler, whose name is Du Naus, which means Lord of Curls, so he apparently was a, he had, he had sidewalks even at this period, um, attacked the Christians and he claimed the throne in Thafar, this very important site down here. So there was a huge massacre of the Christians by the Jews up here in Najran. This was, in, in early histories of the Middle East, this is a very, very pivotal point, the uh, massacre at Najran. Supposedly between 20 and 40,000 Christians were killed. And in response, the Ethiopians invaded Yemen to protect the Christians. And this again was supported by the Byzantine king, or the, the emperor Justinian. And so then we started having other people showing up. Uh, there was a Christian revival after the Ethiopians intervened under King Abraha, who you might have heard of. Uh, Abraha becomes, he's a very important figure in Ethiopian history and in Yemeni history. He expels the Jews, and then the Christian kingdom continues. Um, one more pushback by the Ethiopians in 570. Ethiopians again invade Yemen, and then they try to go up into, they attack Mecca, which is quite interesting. And this is in the Bible and in the Quran, when Ethiopian, Ethiopian forces enter Mecca to attack the Kaaba, again this is in the pre-polytheistic pre period, and according to the Quran, they were defeated by a hail of pebbles dropped from the beaks of birds. Uh, other sources say there was probably an outbreak, outbreak of smallpox, but the Christian attack on the Kaaba was then stopped. So by the seventh century, the local rulers of this area appealed to the Persians to come in and help them stabilize the Persians, as they often did in ancient world, came and stayed longer than they were invited to. So then we have this under Persian rule. By 628, this area is all converted to Islam, and the Yemenis today brag that their Arabic is by far the purest Arabic of any of the Arabs, and they consider themselves to be the purest bloodlines of any of the Arabs, regardless of what other people might say. Even in Yemen today, when you see men dressed in a white turban and a green sash, and they have these big cur curved daggers called jambia, when it's worn at an angle, that indicates that person is what's called Sayyid. He traces his family directly back to the Prophet Muhammad. So there's a lot of a lot of reverence in this country. Well, Oman, where we will be tomorrow, this area, northern Oman, and what is now part of the UAE, the United Arab, Arab Emirates, was the ancient land of Magan, M-A-G-A-N, was as it was known in the Assyrian records from at least 2700 BC, when the people in this area were trading with the uh, Sumerians and Akkadians up in this area, when they're bringing the copper up and this chloride stone up and trading with this area. And again, a major product that they're trading is not only the uh, chloride and copper, but frankincense. And this is what a frankincense tree looks like, in case you've never seen one. They're not really pretty by any one's imagination. They're very snarly, very rough. And these uh, frankincense is, is obtained by slitting the bark of the tree, and then it exudes the resin. This is frankincense resin which is then collected, and then you can go to shops like in Salala and buy frankincense. And so you're gonna see lots and lots of these shops, and they're just, they're beautiful, because all the little containers and different colors. This was taken some time ago, but I can't imagine that it's gonna be much different. So it's still, frankincense is a big, big product in Oman. And what better gift for the holidays, right? The frankincense ticket home. So after about 2000 BC, the trade uh, with copper of Mesopotamia collapses. The Persians come in about the seventh century BC. And um, then a dark age, again, after the trade moves primarily from the 
uh, land off to the sea. But there's new prosperity with um, Hormuz, which will be in the Straits of Hormuz when we get up toward Dubai as a trade center. There's still a lot of trade. When we're in Musandam, um, it's been a few years since I've been there, but I do remember the little boats going back and forth, and you'll see the um, sheep and goats in these little boats going to Persia, and then the boats full of cigarettes coming to Oman. So, it's, But Oman was, an, oh, was a very, very important sea power. Sinbad the sailor, he's from Oman. Uh, pearl divers, a very, very important uh, seafaring country. Uh, Vasco da Gama had an Omani navigator on board. Uh, Alfonso de, Al de Albuquerque, shown here, established trade colonies on the west coast of India and also in Oman. At one point, he sacked Muscat, which is the, which is the capital of Oman. This is what Muscat looks like. And built these enormous Portuguese forts on either side of the, uh, of the harbor. These are the forts of Marani and Jalali. And Oman is still full of Portuguese forts that have been taken over by the Omanis and restored. So there's a huge amount of kind of colonial, colonial history. For the ancient sites in northern Oman and Dubai, because again, they're all kind of culturally the same in the ancient period, although now they're divided into different, different uh, nationalities, different countries. By the way, this is the, uh, the palace. This is the Alam Palace, uh, Kamus's palace. In, downtown Muscat, as I, also, I'll, I'll say a few words at the end of this, but he's quite the architectural connoisseur. So the, uh, the group, the culture in this area in ancient times is called Umalnar. Umalnar, it's wonderful, it means mother of fire. I don't know why, but that's the name of the culture. And so these are distribution of Umalnar sites. So it's very, this is Musandam right here. Uh, Tel Abrak is right outside of Dubai. Um, Umal Nar is the, this is near Abu Dhabi, that's the main site, but these are all, these are all the same cultural site, and especially Hilly, very important site, which straddles, this is a disputed area, the Bahraini Oasis has been disputed between Oman and uh, UAE for many, many years. But a very interesting culture, we know it primarily from the funerary remains, but we have records that talk about farming, birding, fishing, it was a center for, center for metal work, bronze and, and copper casting, tin probably coming in from Afghanistan, so a lot of trade network through here, and a lot of objects also from the Indus Valley, as you can imagine, from the proximity of the uh, Mahendradaro group to this. So the Umal Nahar culture lasts from about 2500 to 2000 BC, and what we know most about it are these spectacular tombs, these enormous tombs, these are about 30 meters across, some of these are communal tombs. Some of these might be private tombs. This one has been reconstructed at Hilly uh, in Burning the Oasis. And they're made out of these enormous, so like a person is about maybe up to here. So we're talking about very big structures. One little opening and uh, very, very fabulous architecture. And another view of it here was some of the earliest figurative uh, representations we have from this part of the Gulf, another view of it. So the ibexes again, or to say they're the same ibexes, and then men. The interior of these are segmented because many of these, as I mentioned, are, commun are communal tombs. One enormous tomb had more than 300 individuals in it and must have been used over several centuries. This idea of many people in one tomb may indicate a more tribal or communal mentality in the social organization, in contrast to another site we'll look at, Dillman, which is very much individual tombs. So most of these Umalnar tombs are 5 to uh, 13 meters in diameter. They were only discovered in the 1960s, so if you haven't heard about this, it's not so surprising. And here are some diagrams of the interior of these Umalnar monuments. Now briefly, just filling in the other of these big ancient cultures in this general area we're going to be in, Bahrain, here, the island. Bahrain means between the two seas. Very, very important island because it has, get this, uh, underwater aquifers. It's one of the places where they have underwater aquifers. So boats in ancient times and in modern times could come 
around this, and there are water spouts where they could actually f fill their stocks of, of fresh water while they're still at sea. This is really an interesting place. Um, it had archaeologists completely puzzled for many, many years. In the 50s and 60s, a Danish expedition was working here. His name was Bibby. And again, a very popular book at the time, I don't know if you remember, it was Looking for Dillman. I don't remember that. It was one of those great archaeological sort of, you know, who done it. And uh, we know from Dillman from at least the fourth millennium BC, very, very old culture. So again, we're up in here, Bahrain at this point. Um, lots of transshipping from surrounding areas, especially the Indus Valley. So we have a lot of ivory, ivory and carnelian, tin from Afghanistan, timber, copper from Oman, and a lot of metalworking. So again, very prosperous little kingdoms or, or uh, nationalities around this area. The Dilmun period is from about 3200 BC to Alexander the Great, and the main architectural uh, monuments are the Barber Temple, which I'll show you in just a moment. From the early 5th century AD, it was a Christian center, and then it was converted to Islam. The thing that really puzzled archaeologists about Bahrain is the, most of the island is covered with tombs, ancient tombs, and they couldn't figure out what was going on here. They estimated at least 85,000 burial mounds at this one area, Hamid Town, Sar and Al-Ali, that date to about 2200 BC. They were such a prominent part of the landscape that the archaeologists were thinking that maybe the bodies were being brought from the mainland and being brought, maybe, maybe Bahrain was a sacred burial ground. So they couldn't figure out how so many people could be buried in Bahrain. Different types of tombs. This is at um, El Ali. These are, these are ancient burial mounds, and they go on and on and on and on. Now archaeologists know that the people who are buried on Bahrain were, in fact, living in Bahrain, but it, there's just a huge amount of prominence given to the tombs. Uh, this is a cross-section of these tombs. Some of these are individual, some of them are communal, and some of them have freestanding walls, as this one at Sar. These date to about, there are about 1,500 examples of this, these, this type dating to 2000 BC. Some of these are as big as 50 meters in uh, diameter, and another, a segmented one at Sar. There's a separate children's uh, cemetery, and some of the, these had grave goods like baskets, seals, daggers. But we also see at Sar not only these sort of big individual tombs, but a really bizarre thing, which is not known elsewhere. And this is, oh, see, that's a diagram of the Sar tombs, the, ind the individual and penal tombs. But then we start seeing this sort of stuff, where it's a honeycomb. These are individual tombs, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tombs which are just built literally like a big honeycomb. So this was apparently a very important place for people to live and also to be buried. But we do have more than tombs in this area to attest to this culture. This is the remains of one of the most important temples from the ancient Middle East. It's called the Barber Temple. And it's mainly under a later structure, but it is uh, this is the structure that is under the Arwad Fort. But the thing that's very interesting about this, this is it went through three different stages of, of construction. It is an oval temple and with an oval section here with a sacred well that relates it very specifically to the Sumerian temples in Mesopotamia. So there's very clearly a tie between these two areas. And here's a nice model of the Barber Temple uh, with, the, with the curved wall. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the site of Dilmun itself, because it was so important. And Dilmun is very famous also for its a lot of connection with the Indus Valley. This is the main part of the Middle East, ancient Middle East, that is in contact with the Indus Valley. OK. Then, because we're going to be in Oman tomorrow, I just want to say a few words about this man. You're going to be seeing his photograph all over the place. This is Sultan Qaboos. In my book, The Best Looking a mirror in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. This guy is absolutely incredible. He, there was a bloodless coup against his father, Syed, in 1970. When Qaboos took over, Qaboos, by the way, was educated uh, partially in England. He, has a, he took his military training at Sandhurst, 
So there's a lot of British colonial stuff still going on in, in Oman. But I first went on to Oman, I was meeting with tourism authorities, and they were all old British guys. So Kabus kept a lot of the British administrators. This guy is absolutely incredible. When he took over, Oman had nothing. It had less than nothing. It was horrible. It had no schools. It had no roads. It had no national budget. It had nothing. Just like, as we'll see in Yemen, uh, his father was felt so pressured by the West. Uh, there's a great thing. Uh, he said, I will give my people what I want them to have, not what they want. He said, look what happened to the surrounding countries when they westernized. Look what happened. So he said, no eyeglasses, no radios, nothing. So they were living basically in the medieval ages until Kabu said, enough. This guy is, um, he's basically an absolute monarch. But when you see what he's done, sometimes totalitarian stuff works pretty well. A uh, very admirable guy. He has incredibly, he's done so much to modernize the country without wrecking the country. The country is probably the cleanest country maybe you will ever been. Has anybody been in Oman? Okay, very few people. It is very, very clean. It is very polite. It's just bizarre. When I used to take a lot of groups to Yemen, I referred to Yemen as the Islamic Wild West and to Oman as the Islamic Disneyland. Because it is, there's a one of the most famous sayings in Yemen, and I'm going to paraphrase it, is the, um, the jewels of a woman are her pearls. The jewels of a man are his good breeding and quiet, quietness. So it's like, not like Egypt where people are, you know, waving their arms. It's a very, very interesting society. Uh, now he's opened lots of different uh, universities. Women are educated. There are women in the police force. Uh, huge conservation efforts. You'll see, uh, for example, not too far from Salala, there are several very large nature reserves. There's a big horse breeding project. There's the White Oryx Conservation Project. There are whole sections of the coast of Oman which are completely protected for um, tortoise, but uh, for the tortoise, so what do we call a flock of tortoises? Turtles. Tur turtles, yeah, yeah. And so this guy is absolutely incredible, and he has a great attention to detail. When I was there a lot in the, in the late 80s, when he was building new hotels, he would personally approve the carpets, the tablecloths. They built this big hotel called the Bustan Palace, which is really incredible, and he didn't like the paneling. In the conference room, all replaced. This guy is it's, it's micromanaging, but micromanaging in an extremely interesting way. There's a beautification project, which I haven't been in Salala for a while, but um, Muscat was starting to sprout you know, every rotary, every you know, uh, circle, highway. There would suddenly be huge concrete books. You know, there'd be all these statues, these crazy statues of huge coffee pots and, and boats and Sinbad the Sailor. And it's part of the Omanification, the, the beautification project. In, in, on the highways, instead of like just having a um, embankment, or what do you call it, the, you know, the side of, of a road that goes up, he's turned it in, some of them look like the sides of like pirate ships, where he's got portholes. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing that he can't decorate. <laughs> so it's, so I want you to know who this person is, because you're gonna be, this is a fairly older, uh, so he, he took over in 1970, he's still going strong. Some other very interesting things we can talk about with Kabus. He's known as His Majesty. Or, uh, he's very beloved by his subjects, and he's, he's a true one-off. So when we're there tomorrow, think about what this guy has achieved with this country. So thank you very much.